the second edition of the School of Sciences International Seminar Cycle. Uh, the first one was on biology, and today it will be on industry, maybe. So it's our pleasure to, to welcome Dr. Niels Pickert. Um, Dr. Pickert uh, is a particle physicist. He did uh, his degree in, uh, in Germany, in Erlangen, and afterwards he did a, a PhD in particle physics working in DAISY uh, in the north of Germany, uh, studying the, the spin of the proton. And uh, after his PhD, um, he switched gears and is now working in the, in the house division of Siemens, in Siemens Thousand Years, where is uh, Solution engineer, you'll yep. will tell us whatever what that means and uh, a bit about uh, uh, what is been doing in Siemens and this uh, this passage from uh, from the academia to, to industry. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It's uh, it's our pleasure. Um, Dr. Pickett uh, speaks Portuguese, but uh, the seminar will be in English. It's an international seminar, so it will be in English. And uh, on a side comment, I believe that learned to speak Portuguese in Braille precisely many years ago. So <laughs> welcome and uh, thank you. And thank you for having me. Um, Kind of exactly 23 years ago, I, I arrived in Braga for the language course uh, during my Erasmus study. So um, I have some connections to Braga. Um, yeah, I want to talk briefly about my switch from physics to industry, what's different in industry, what's different in working culture and everything um, around that, but also give a brief overview of, of what my division of Siemens Health Engineers is doing, so not my division, but the division I'm working in, uh, and um, what our challenges are in developing what a physicist does there, and um, what is the expectation of physicists in industry. Um, so first, uh, I need to break up the point again. Um, okay. Yeah, just for motivation. Um, if you can read that somehow, yeah, not really well. Um, every year, 15 million people die of stroke. Um, so, um, blood clots blocking an artery in the brain and killing some brain cells. Nearly 18 million people a year die from cardiac diseases, cardiovascular diseases, meaning a blocked artery or blocked vein in the heart. Um, about 9.6 million people die of cancer every year. Um, and about 500,000 people suffer spinal cord injuries per year. This is the area where we work in and where our devices are used. In. So this affects potentially a lot of people. Um, for stroke, standard treatment in the future, hopefully, will be mechanical thrombectomy, which means you go in the brain with a catheter and remove the blood clot from the artery. So you mechanically remove the um, blocking of the artery and restore the blood flow to the brain. This saves about $30 billion a year if this would be uh, possible in, in the US alone. Um, it will lead to having 50, nearly 50% 50 of the people having a stroke leading, uh, being able to lead a normal life again, versus currently with the traditional medicine approach right now, uh, which is medicine, uh, which is um, medicament based chemical approach mostly, um, which only leads to 13% of um, people being able to live an independent and normal life. Um, for lung cancer, um, we have um, also a lot of saving potential by being able to detect the lung cancer more exactly where it is located in the lung. And it will reduce the time at risk for the patient. Time at risk means time where anything can go wrong during the procedure by about 94%, which means a dramatic reduction for the risk of the patient. 
Um, for spine surgery, uh, spine surgery is, for example, if you have um, scoliosis, so a bent spine, um, then uh, the physicians go there with actually mechanical screws and, and drill in holes in your spine and put a rigid frame to, to straighten you up. Um, with better imaging, we could save um, a lot of money, a lot of time, but it also will allow patients to go home earlier from right now, it's 11 to 17 weeks they stay in hospital or in, um, in uh, some kind of care institution to something like seven weeks um, only. Um, there's for heart valve replacement, there's also now minimal invasive therapy. Traditional approaches cut open the whole chest, open the heart, and do a lot of open surgery. Uh, you can do that now minimally invasive. And um, you reduce a lot of risk on, for the patients. You have 40% lower hospital stay, uh, short hospital stay, and you have 50% lower mortality. So this is all the areas where we're working. So it's cardiology, where we do everything um, for minimally invasive vessel uh, treatment and also heart valve treatment. Uh, we are working in intervention radiology, which is all kind of neuro stuff in the brain and also um, the big vessels in, in, in the body. Uh, for example, the treatment of aneurysms, where you have a kind of um, a sac on your arteries. So there's a a uh, um, malformation of the artery, which can produce blood clots and so on. Also treated with our machines, uh, using our machines in spinal surgery and cancer therapy. Siemens in total, that's the propaganda slide, and I will be done with the propaganda slides after that. Uh, we make a lot of money, 50 billion nearly uh, last year, and we bought Varian as well, which also brings in 3 million um, revenue. Uh, we are in about 70 countries, we have 66,000 employees. Uh, so our phone book is pretty big, and finding the right person sometimes is a bit tricky. Um, a lot of patents. Um, Big buzzword right now is AI, so um, also 60 products which have AI, whatever that means. Um, and we have, I think the most important thing is we have about 600,000 systems in the field, 600,000 machines. We need to keep track of, we need to repair, and we need to maintain uh, for their lifetime, which is something like 10 to 20 years, um, sometimes even more. We once had a request for a service for a machine that was Sold in 1950 or something. Uh, the physicians asked if we could repair that. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't and had to put it immediately. <laughs> okay, who am I? Um, yeah, as Nuno said, I studied physics in Erlangen. Um, if you don't know Erlangen, um, it's mostly famous for a pop song from Neue Deutsche Welle, and that's about all the fame it gets. It's close to Nuremberg, uh, region with the highest brewery density in the world, and pretty nice place to study. It's it's same size as Braga, but a bit smaller than Braga, 100,000 inhabitants. So you can walk around everywhere and you still have some, some nightlife. Um, I did Erasmus in Puebla, um, and I got my language training in Portuguese here in uh, Braga in 1998. And Left Portugal then in August 1999 or September 1999. It was a lot longer than planned. Um, then 2003 to 2008, I did my PhD uh, and the Hannes Ripoll detector, uh, working on the silicon detector. Physical challenge was placing a silicon detector directly next to the uh, Hera beam, uh, which is electromagnetic hell. Uh, so that was kind of a challenge. And then I left university and science and went on to work at Siemens as a software tester, later on as a test manager, um, being responsible for um, testing a product according to um, yeah, regulatory requirements so that we need to prove that our device works safely. And this is done with software testing, I will show in the next slide. 
and this was my job then. In 2011, I switched then to become a system engineer, or it's now called solution engineer. Um, I will show what that exactly is. So what I'm doing as a system engineer is you start development of product by finding a problem. So there's a clinical problem. A physician wants to do something, wants to see some organ, wants to treat something, or wants, has a clinical problem which might have a technical solution. Um, this is collected by our, our product managers, and they say, okay, please develop something for this part. And then come in uh, the system engineers or the solution engineers and figure out the technical solution for something. So we have the clinical problem and we translate that into a technical problem. And this technical problem then is further detailed in the system design. So we know, okay, to image that part of the body, we need X-ray and we need this energy and we need this resolution and we need this whatever. And then the system engineer takes this information and says, okay, to get this resolution, we need this detector, to get this energy, we need this cube. And um, basically it's designing the overall system and splitting it apart into subsystems, which then get handed over to domain experts. So for the tubes, for example, X-ray tubes, we have people who have a lot of knowledge on X-ray tubes. For me, an X-ray tube is that size, current in, X-ray out, and uh, everything else they do. Um, so we are on the highest level splitting up the system and subsystems and figuring out what the subsystems should do. And then the technical experts come and develop the subsystems according to our wishes or specifications. Um, for everything, what we do, we have tests on every level. So um, on subsystem level, we have tests on code level, on, on electrical level and so on, where we prove that the stuff we're developing is actually doing what it should. Then we put everything together. So when we have tested the parts, we put them together to build a system. That's the system integration. We find a lot of errors and usually it takes a couple of months to get everything working because everything's designed according to specification, then you put it together and then, then you figure out works as specified, doesn't mean it works. Um, and then we um, do a system test, system integration test. So this is then checking if the system does clinically what it should do and does functionally what it should do. Then comes the system test where we put actual, either our product managers or actual physicians working with the machines, figuring out if they are, can be used by a physician in clinical use. Because that's another problem. If I can use the machine, it doesn't mean a physician can use it. Um, that's the usual stuff. We have nicely engineered machines built for engineers, but the problem is people who are using it are not engineers, they are physicians. And they don't care about software. They want, in either case, they don't want to push a button in that thing. X-ray machine should work automatically. Um, that's the main machine I'm working on. Uh, the Artis Icono X-ray system. And um, which you can't really see. <laughs> the projector. Uh, it's basically you have one or two detectors. The stuff you really can't see here. There's an X-ray here and here. Um, and the patient goes somewhere in here. So you have a bed normally where the patient is placed in the center of these two x ray beams. Um, you can also have a machine that only has this part, so only one uh, detector, um, either floor mounted or ceiling mounted. And these are used for anything minimally invasive. So anything where you put a catheter in the patient to treat something. Be it brain, be it liver, be it uh, large vessels in, in, in the legs or arms, be it cardiology, um, you can do with these machines. So we have a lot of um, different clinical fields with different requirements we address with that system. We have a lot of performance stuff, so we need high image quality with low dose, which are two things which normally are anti-correlated. The, the higher the dose, the better the image gets. 
uh, but also you don't want to, to uh, have a lot of those for the physicians and the patient. And uh, you need real time because uh, when you push a catheter in the brain, uh, I need to have an accuracy of, of half a millimeter or, or less. You don't want to have a lag of more than 500 milliseconds or so when, when you're pushing it by hand. So there are a lot of technical challenges to get this system working. Um, more stuff you can't see on that slide. Um, <laughs> This um, X-ray machine is basically one of many parts of systems we sell. So we also have CT in our program, so computer tomography systems. Um, we have uh, a and there you see here, which is basically an industrial robot, you know, from, from car manufacturing with an X-ray machine mounted on top of it. So there's this C arm should be here, and this, this is the a robot which you normally know from uh, car industry in the orange. We have the special white version, uh, but it's the same manufacturer. And this is used in surgery where you need really crazy angles uh, to see um, through the patient. Um, we are doing combined systems where we have the X-ray system and a CT system in the same room, and you can move in the CT system on sliding rails, and you can move in the, the X-ray system. Uh, we have uh, ultrasound systems, we have mobile CRs, uh, which means the same machine as, as I showed before, but smaller and on trolley. Uh, and the newest addition to the family is this thing here, which I hope you can see in the, one of the further slides a bit better, um, is the Corindus robot, which is a robot about this size, uh, which is used to push catheters remotely. So um, normally the, the physician is, is pushing the catheters and the wires by hand. And with this robot, you can push it easily by, via joysticks, meaning you can sit in the control room. You don't need to have all the lab around, lab aprons where, uh, on you and save a lot of dose for the actual physician. So um, dose is a big problem for physicians. Um, there's a study that cardiologists have a really high rate of brain tumors um, on the left side where the x-ray tube is. So this affects a lot of physicians. Um, the stuff I work on is about half of that. So my special part is the integration of our system with other systems. Um, integration can be just they are in the same room and don't disturb each other. Um, integration can also mean we have a very high integration that have software interfaces and hardware interfaces and we need to make sure that everything's right. Um, and um, I've worked on, on with, with external vendors like Carto and Medigide. They those used to be small startups in Israel and are now the biggest player on the market and belonging to St. Jude and uh, to Abbott. And um, uh, it's Johnson and Johnson. So they also get bought by big companies. Um, next part is Andrew CT is one part I explain a bit later, um, which is a CT system and the Andrew system, which I already mentioned, and which we also integrate with ultrasound systems and intravascular ultrasound, optical tomography system. There are all kinds of, there's a whole zoo of uh, medical devices which you need. What's challenging when you develop a medical device? So the, the medical device needs to pass first regulatory rules and tests. So if you, if you place a medical device on the market, you cannot just say, okay, this medical device has fun. Uh, you need to register it with regulatory bodies. They want to have proof that it works. They want to have proof that it's um, medically efficient, that it's better than the procedure you did before. Um, you need to prove that it's safe uh, for patient and operator. So there's all kinds of regulatory boundaries. Then there's safety. Safety is actually something you don't really need to discuss. Patient needs to survive the treatment uh, and hopefully the physician as well. So, um, all devices need to work under all conditions in an, a 
in, in the worst case, you have a, an operating theater, you have an uh, emergency surgery, patient comes in, blood everywhere, 500 people running around crazy, and a uh, lot of machines brought in, and everything needs to work safely. And if there is something broken, it needs to break safely. So you cannot just say, okay, device doesn't stops working. It's sometimes not a safe thing. Um, usability is a big thing. So it needs to be operated by physicians, nurses, technicians under stress in emergency conditions. They don't want to have a 50 level menu in tiny font uh, and so on. So you, everything needs to be op operatable in horrible conditions, complex situations, and emergency cases. And one important thing, which sometimes gets a bit hidden, is reimbursement policy. So uh, hospital wants to make money with that machine. So um, we need to develop the machine so that the hospital can get reimbursement for the costs they, they have. So this is sometimes a problem when you have fancy new technology and there's no code they could put to the insurance company. So uh, this is something where uh, we need to have some way that it fits into the reimbursement policy in all kinds of healthcare systems. Stupid example, we can do very fancy 3D images. In some countries, a 3D image is one X-ray image, and in some other country, it's uh, 300 something single frames. Uh, you put came from the uh, insurance company. So there's a lot of difference in money they can get back from the insurance company. And we need to sell it accordingly that it fits. Development process um, is basically what I already showed to you. So we start with the clinical technical problem, document system design, subsystem design, and then to the actual code and hardware. So there are four levels of people doing paperwork, and then there are the people who actually do real work. Um, all that stuff is written down in specifications. So the clinical problem ends up in the system requirement specifications saying for the, physic for the physician to do something, the system needs to do something. Um, then you get to the system functional specification that goes to, then to, in order to do something, system needs to react on that input and produce that output. Uh, next level then is the system architecture or system design specification. We say, okay, system consists of these 57 parts and all these 57 parts are responsible for this part is doing this, this part is doing that. And then we go further and specify all parts individually um, what they should do. When you build the system, then you test according to the specification. So if you say system, if I push that button, that light should go on. Then in the test, you have a test, push that button, check that the light goes on. Um, and for everything we need to have, for every feature functionality we specify here, we need to have a test. We need to have a test report and we hand that test report to the uh, FDA and other regulatory bodies to prove that our system is working. That's the technical part. And if you now zoom a bit out, there's more paperwork. Uh, so we have a lot of project management stuff. So there's a quality management plan, a project plan, a document plan, a technical file, main review protocols, a device health record, and a device management record. If there's any clinical stuff we claim, saying, okay, we can treat this, uh, this um, illness more effect efficiently with our system. We need to have proofs for that. So there are all kind of clinical studies we need to archive. Um, we have manufacturing specifications so that our factory knows how to manufacture the, the device. You have compatibility test reports, which means basically when, when you combine two devices into a new system, it still works. Uh, there's customer and service documentation, there's test plan, test report, safety testing reports, there are all these uh, EMC, electromagnetic compatibility testing reports, there are regulatory registration. So there's 
a lot of paperwork involved. And that's something which is completely different than in university. So you have grants and funding and stuff, um, but you don't have all these stuff mandatory. It's sometimes nice to do it, but it's you're not forced by law, law to have a document plan for the big projects. So um, just some numbers. We printed out the uh, system specifications for our artist system. So just the high level system should do something specs, and that's a pile about 1.3 meter high of paper. Uh, and the total paperwork printed out is probably five to ten times. So we didn't didn't want to print out all the paperwork. It's, uh, would have cost half a forest. So, um, but we have a lot of non-technical work to do. So what's the challenges actually in developing stuff? Um, so one part I developed is called the third party broker, which is sounds fancy, but it's just a software interface between medical devices. Uh, using off the shelf software. So, um, using a protocol called AMQT. Uh, there's an open source implementation we put in our system, and we hope that the other manufacturers put it on their system uh, so that our devices can talk to each other. Biggest problem there is not technical. Technical, it's uh, put the software works. Um, the problem is right now convincing people that it makes sense to have a standard. It makes we have a lot of historically grown stuff in our system. So the, the artist system itself is something like 20 years old and there are all kind of weird traps where you can, you expect a message coming from that subsystem, but actually it's coming from that subsystem because back in time, somebody thought it was a good idea uh, and nobody remembers that anymore. And we have a lot of politics stuff. So when we come and say, hey, we have a fancy new interface, uh, St. Jude, please use it. They say, no, you use our interface. Uh, and so there are a lot of politics. Um, infrastructure stuff is always hard to sell to management. Management wants, okay, if I do this, how, much, how many millions do I get? And this interface is something, yeah, you don't get anything, basically. It's, you have a potential that some other device manufacturer might use it, and then we have something we could theoretically sell with its, yeah, its infrastructure. So it's hard to tell management to make a sound business case. And regulatory, um, it's not a standard interface. We need to prove that it's working. And if it's standard, it's easy because you prove it against the standard. If it's not a standard, then you have to prove every combination individually and uh, it gets a lot of work. Um, that's another thing I worked on that was the Nexaris system, which is this fairly visible donut there. It's a CT system. This is our end user system. This is the patient table, and you can move in the CT and, and do CT on the patient, and you can move in the end user system and do fluoroscopy and an x ray on the patient. Basic idea, very simple. Um, we already solved that about 100 times as individually tailored solutions. Um, so everybody thought, hey, that's easy. Just put a bit of paperwork and we're done. Turned out not to be the case. Um, so one problem was because everybody thought it was easy. We were just, uh, I don't know, five people in that team. Uh, we haven't worked together before, so uh, we didn't have any money. We were not allowed to change anything on the system just because it's already working. Uh, and it was a bit of a disaster project uh, in the beginning, but in, after having two years more than originally planned and five million more than originally planned, it worked out as a three Cool product, but it was hard on a yeah, collaboration side. And, and technical problem also wasn't really hard. The technical problem is there are five wires going between the systems. So. Um, next thing that's this catheter driving robot. Um, a small company in the US we bought two years ago for 1.3 billion euros or US dollars. Uh, the company was at that time 50 people. Biggest challenge was getting that company 50 people working very individually, creatively and 
everybody doing everything into the big world of Siemens processes where you have a specialized department for everything. Uh, and um, just when we introduced SAP there, uh, the whole SAP task force was, for, I think, four times the size of the actual company itself. So 200 people introducing software and a 50 people company. Um, they did a really good job and introduced this horrible software in a very quick time and um, managed to get them working on it. So very good job of these 200 people, but it's still a big culture clash. Um, previously, they sold about 10 per year. Now business wants us to sell hundreds per year. So this scale up is just crazy. And you cannot do something like everybody is driving in the screws manually, you need to go to industrial process. So this is a big challenge. Um, you have two different ways of thinking and process and everything. And then on the same time, the company grows from 50 people to 200 people. So there are around, I think, 200, 220 people there. Some of the uh, old people there left. So not, not age-wise old, but old with the company. Uh, so the, a lot of knowledge from the history just went away. And technical problem is just that we, we put that robot on the table and they coexist. So it's uh, paperwork to prove that it's safe, but no technical challenge. Big challenge, get this whole crazy mess of people somewhat working together. Um, that's the past, the future. When I get back on Monday, um, I will start working hopefully on this stuff. Um, it's an advancement of this robot. Um, and this robot right now is used for cardiology procedures to get the physician away from the radiation and save them those and, and that they can work without the lab. The next generation is thought to, uh, is for um, stroke cases to perform this thrombectomy stuff. Big problem there is if you have a stroke, um, I don't know about Braga, probably you have a stroke unit here in the hospital, um, but these stroke units most often can't do thrombectomies. So they can detect a stroke, they can um, do all the diagnosis, and then you get transferred to a hospital where you do that thrombectomy. Um, I, I checked for the Algarve. Um, in the Algarve, uh, you don't have anything. You have a stroke center where they put you in a CT. If you need a thrombectomy, they fly you in a helicopter to Lisbon, which takes three hours. And mm -hmm. if you're lucky and the helicopter's working, stuff like that. Um, there are stories uh, from, we heard from a conference in Paris. Two hospitals, one has the stroke center, one has the thrombectomy center, five kilometers apart. Um, with the traffic in Paris, it's four hours from CT to treatment. And in a stroke case, that means half of your brain is gone. So the idea is, if you can't get the patient to the physician, try to get uh, the physician somehow to the patient and allow remote treatment. So put a robot in the stroke center or in every smaller hospital and allow the uh, specialized neurologist to perform the procedure remote controlled over internet. And therefore reducing the time from diagnosis to treatment drastically. So idea, remote robotics. Um, we take the C-arm, put a robot there, and this is put in a, in a room in every smaller hospital. And we take this control room stuff, which now sits just next door and put it in the central hospital where the uh, specialized neurologist is. And he or she gets a, a control uh, panel for the robot and a control panel for the X-ray system and get some live streaming of the actual X-ray image. So you can control the catheter, you can control the X-ray remotely the um, Technical challenge. Latency. Um, you need to have latency of less than 700 milliseconds uh, to be able to work safely. The lower, the better. Um, you need to have full image quality. 
full image quality means we have uh, the, our whole screen is 4K, um, 4K with 60 hertz uh, repetition rate um, and 12 bit bit depth. Uh, if you calculate the bandwidth from that, it's gigantic. Uh, so we need to have some kind of compression algorithms and smart ways to reduce that data bandwidth. Um, there were the first trials already. So um, there were some simulated cases in the US where they did some transcontinental stuff using 5G networks from Verizon. Um, there was also a first in human case uh, in India by Dr. Patel, um, who did a remote cardiac treatment uh, from 20 kilometers distance on a dedicated fiber optic line. Uh, so they just got a fiber for themselves. Um, so no public internet. So they are the first proof of concept systems existing. But um, doing that over public internet will be a bit challenging. There's regulatory stuff. So nobody has ever done that. So all the laws don't cover it. So we try to figure out what are the, the legal boundaries of that. Our lawyers are still searching because um, there is no law for remote treatment. And there's, of course, human factors. You have uh, two teams or a team and a physician working together who can't talk to each other, who can talk to each other via, via Zoom or something like that. But um, we're sitting hundreds of kilometers away in the worst case, uh, who work once a month together. Uh, and they need to work as a team who acts blindly. So this is um, a big challenge. Um, yeah, future. This is now not Monday. This is three, four, five, ten years. Um, right now, we have some kind of helping algorithms for the cat leader movement. So um, we have some magic turning mechanisms when you when you get to a branch of the vessel with your guide wire to get into the branching vessel. You sometimes need to do some little tweaking, um, so wiggle a bit forth and back, and then you get into the branch test. This is now automated with some smart algorithms and some smart technology to, to do that. Or if you have to pass a, a lesion, so if they have some calcifications in the vessel and you need to pass that, then we have some kind of a vibrator mode where you just can get through. Um, but the final goal is do everything automatically. So you just tell the system, uh, here's my treatment point, please go there. Uh, and this is where we are now investing a lot of money and a lot of person power into the um, development of some smart systems based on machine learning, based on image recognition, um, that you have some kind of an, an autopilot for catheters that you can first say, okay, I, I get in here, I have the vision there, first find me the way how to get there. And the second point is then actually driving the robot to get there. So this closed loop image guided autonomous navigation is something we are hoping to have in maybe 10 years. Um, yeah, so that's all the technical stuff. Um, now the general part, what's different working in industry and working in science. Uh, disclaimer, I only worked at Hamas, so my view of uh, science is limited to one medium-sized particle physics experiment. Um, everything else, I can't tell. Um, and industry also working in two groups in Siemens Health and Gifts, so <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. So what's different? Biggest thing, money. Um, this is the table um, in Germany, when you work in industry, uh, usually you work on a union negotiated contract, so collaborative, uh, collective contract, everybody gets the same. Um, you start um, as a, with a PhD usually in, uh, in Gate Group 11 or in Gate Group 12, uh, which is something like, um, I work in Bavaria, so it's something like 5,100 to 5,600 per month or a 35 hour contract. Um, we pay about 45% of taxes of that, plus 
uh, insurance. So what ends up on your account is about half of that. Um, in university, um, you work 38.5 hours contracts normally, uh, and as a postdoc, and uh, generally there's something called junior prof, uh, which is first level of professorship. Uh, you start with E12 or E13, as far as I know, uh, which is uh, 3,700 to 4,100 euros. So um, you get something like 20% more in the industry. Um, there's also 35 hours at 35 hours. Every hour extra is counted on, a, on, a, um, on an account. And you can either take that then off as, as free time or uh, you get paid, you get extra payment for that. I don't think you have that in university. University, extra hours included. Um, Contracts in industry are not time limited, so you start and if you don't get fired, you can work immediately, indefinitely, and if you get fired, you need to do something with that. Normally, um, in university, you work on temporary contracts, um, one year, two years, and you need them to find another contract. And in Germany, I think you're only allowed to work eight years on temporary contracts, and then you need an uh, unterminated. Um, or leave university and work some grants, which happens most of the time. Um, what's also different is yeah, the working culture. So, and the biggest thing there is working culture is something which in, in industry is actively considered. So we have first HR department, but then we also have something called um, catalysts um, who are random people from, from the company, I'm one of them, uh, who actually take care of the work culture in their surroundings. So um, you do some kind of you know, psychological training and then you um, try to improve the, the collaboration between your colleagues and, and how to improve the meeting culture, improve the efficiency of meetings. So meetings in the industry are horrible. Um, there, I think then some some of them are more horrible than we had at Hans, but uh, we have people actually taking care of that. Um, we have something people are much more specialized, so we have people who are responsible for a very very tiny fraction of a system or a very tiny tiny part in the whole process. Uh, and um, university, you have more general approach to things. So you don't have a highly specialized process optimizer sitting somewhere and it's everybody's doing everything. Um, I need, from this special, uh, specialization, I need to interact with a lot more a lot more people. So I usually interact with something like 200 people uh, in, in the project and I have a hard time remembering all their names. So it already happens quite a lot that if I meet a colleague uh, I know that guy, I'm working with that guy since years, and I don't remember the name because there are 200 of them, um, which also might be about my age, but um, it's a lot more people than, you have, than I had in university. Um, the actual doing is also not too much. There's a lot of meetings and planning and um, meetings about meetings and stuff like that. So we have a pre-meeting, then we have a meeting, and then we have a post-meeting. And then at the coffee, you talk about what's really happening. Um, this is something which wasn't that way at hands. And we have a different risk culture because as soon as money is involved uh, and management is involved, there's no risks. You, you don't take risks. Things need to work. Um, so first, safety stuff, of course, medical devices. You don't want risky medical devices. If you develop an app and it crashes, who cares? If you develop an X-ray system and it crashes, people die. Uh, so this is something where you definitely don't take risks, but there's also no project risks. You don't want to blow up a project which is worth, I don't know how many millions. So um, if you start a big project, you need to make sure it works. Uh, on the right, 
the orange stuff which you can't read are our seven principles. Um, right, something like um, in, in Germany, we have these pharmacy calendars with nice uh, motivational sayings. Um, they sound a bit like that, but they are, I think they're actually really good because they remind us uh, to checking back on does that really make sense what we're doing? So is what we are doing right now really improving quality? Is what we're doing right now really improving our future business cases and stuff like that? So having some kind of value set uh, helps to reflect to do the right thing. Um, how to get a job in industry? Um, yeah, the QR code here is, uh, gets you to the uh, job offering page of Siemens Health and you can search for jobs worldwide there. Um, most of the entry level jobs and some higher level jobs are post put there online. So um, there are some jobs which are only um, offered internally. But if you want to, if you just start in industry, that's the place where you find the job. Knowing somebody at Siemens uh, doesn't really help you get the job because you still have to follow the whole recruitment process that you normally go through if you know somebody or don't know somebody. What it helps is you know if there is a job and what that job is about. Because if you, if you look at these job offerings on the web page, um, sometimes I have a hard time figuring out what they actually want. So this is, uh, you have a description, which is um, kind of nasty, sometimes it's a bullshit bingo. And then uh, you have a lot of, we would like you to have the following uh, qualifications and you work in, in an international, highly ambitious team and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the actual job description, either you don't really find it there or you need to filter a lot of stuff out and, and figure out what they do. So knowing somebody at Siemens might help you figuring out what that job is actually about and if you fit for that job. And if you apply for a job, don't worry if you don't have half of the qualifications there. Um, if you can, if you're good, that's not a problem. So uh, I think a lot of these qualifications are the perfect candidate, which doesn't exist. Um, then internal job changes are much easier than getting in from the outside. So if you want to work in industry, maybe start working on a job which isn't perfect. Just for example, software tester, I started as a software tester. It's a nice job, you learn a lot, but more than three or four years ago. Um, so it was an entry point to see Siemens to check out if I want to work in industry, um, if I want to work at Siemens Health and yes, AT. Um, I learned a lot on our machines, I learned a lot on the processes, I got to see a lot of the uh, actual hospitals as well. So I, I went to visit some, some hospitals. It's a nice entry point, but it wasn't the uh, always trend of the uh, um, and then, of course, there are these famous pop cycles. So there are times when there are many job offerings, and there are times when there are no job, job offerings. So figuring out when to apply also helps. Um, resuming personal pros and cons. Uh, pros: developing stuff which makes people's life better um, is a big motivation. So before. Then of the proton interests about 500 people, 250 at Thermos and 250 at Compass. And uh, as Thermos is now gone, it's only 250 at Compass. Um, right now, X-ray machines involve a lot more. Regulated working hours are great. So 35 hours and then drop the pencil and go home is great. Uh, and vacation time means vacation time. So I didn't get I, I actually did get one call uh, in this vacation right now, but I ignored it. Um, so this is also great. Money is great. Job safety is great because you don't have to figure out all this temporary contract stuff. And I theoretically could stay on that job till I retire. I don't want to probably, but I could. Uh, the work culture is great, and I really like it most of my colleagues. There are some annoying ones, but uh, I won't mention them.
the cons there's an insane bureaucracy. So if, if you're in a big company, it's I think it, probably the same if you work at Bosch here, um, insane paperwork, insane processes, and you cannot change anything because uh, if you change a little thing, then everything. Um, well, there's a, an avalanche of changes, and and if you push a little bit on this process, then the whole company is affected and it costs million, and you need to involve a lot of people. And so that this is something which really is annoying. Um, this no experiment culture is also something I, I would like to do a bit more experiment stuff and do something which fails. Um, fails in the test lab, doesn't fail at the patient. And yeah, of course, any any change stuff. So we are, we're still working with very old software tools. So um, we're using Teleber we, uh, for our requirement database, which uh, I think we now have the extended, extended, extended support from from Rational or IBM or whoever developed that stuff. Um, and it's because we have everything built up on that. Changing things is costly, and nobody wants to do so. So well, that's the negative part of uh, working in industry. So I think in university, if you're not involved in a big group, if you want to use Perl or C or Visual Studio or whatever you like, just do it. And nobody cares. Um, in Siemens, if I want to use Visual Studio on my machine, I have uh, three departments to deal with and uh, need to introduce it as a validated tool. And I can. Um, if you want more um, info on Siemens um, Healthineers, this QR code we see SiemensHealthineers.com slash perspectives, uh, which is kind of a nice storytelling approach on what we are doing. And there are a lot of interesting stories about people working at Siemens, about the um, physicists using our machines, the medical challenges, and, and so on. Um, they also did an article on me. Um, a nerd in MedTech. Med um, you can also see my little Sterling engine going on, which I have on my desk. Uh, so I'm kind of the crazy guy um, in our department. And that's about it. So this is the official Siemens uh, Healthy News page. And this is, if you want to know more about me, uh, my Twitter stuff and so on. Um, so thanks a lot. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> didn't extend too much, but we still have time for questions. No, 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 we still have time for questions. Thank you very much, Nils. And uh, questions, comments? Then if we have to have questions and one comment. Yep. <laughs> questions are very interesting. Well, thank you very much for your for your lecture. I enjoyed a lot. My first question is that you are like as a technician or as a scientist? Uh, it depends on the time. So it's most most of the time it's technician, very little scientist, uh, and a lot of time uh, kindergartner or uh, <laughs> something where a lot of stuff is dealing with people. And dealing with large groups of people and trying to get these people doing the same thing. And it's, it's, I'm, I'm not in a management position, but uh, a lot of stuff is actually people, people at management, expectation management. And the second one is also quite simple. What is the impact relationship that your company in science and business and we have, we have. So there are a lot of collaborations with medical faculties, so where we do medical studies. Um, we also have some physics connections, um, which is a, a bit more remote because um, we are just using parts which other departments built for us. So all the detectors, for example, uh, come from a collaboration we have actually with Philips, our biggest competitor. Um, but it's developed by Thales Systems, I think, or um, at least the joint venture of Philips, Thales, and Siemens. And they have collaborations with the university on the actual development of the database. 
Um, I will start a collaboration with the inform informatics department of you know, the University of Bamberg in November, probably, uh, where we'll have a uh, master's thesis on network uh, analysis for this remote stuff. So we have individual master thesis. There are also larger collaborations. There are medical studies, and there are all kinds of um, collaborations with the university. But do you supervise any student or master's student in the I, I, yeah, yeah. So I didn't, so far, I will do the master's student in, in November. Um, but colleagues of mine had uh, a lot of master's students on, from, from economy to uh, biology and medical physics and, and so on. Supervised master's students. And the last, last comment, uh, I realized that you make a lot of money with yeah. the companies, so with the content. And uh, I thought that the horrible meeting and the horrible bureaucracy is not their own university, but it occurs only also in your big companies. Yes. So I did not realize that. It's something when I switched from university to, to, mm -hmm. to industry, it was something like going from PhD comics to Dilbert. So Dilbert is really, really true. And you mentioned what lots of people and lots of things in the same industry should try out with this. Yeah, we, we, we have the same dynamics. <laughs> um, any more questions? Also in Zoom. Uh, I'm a bit far away, so also in Zoom, if people have questions, please go ahead. Or in the room. It's not that I will pick that from this last one because how do you see the, the possibility? So imagine a research group at the university has uh, some uh, technology with potential to, to go to how to make a bridge to, to large industries because it's very, very hard. Even if you have technology already with very high TRL, it's very, very hard to, to pass it in, uh, in my experience. So how do you see it? Uh, what, what can be done to, to, to bridge this to this very different worlds? Um, so first there is personal connection. So if you, if you talk about it and you know somebody and know somebody then you can make personal connections. There's no I, I'm not sure if there's an official way that probably is. Um, a lot of stuff goes um, via smaller companies. So uh, Siemens buys components from smaller companies who then develop that stuff with uh, with universities. So I think for for physics department and especially um, we have some connections, so all the our the tech guys still have uh, go to conferences and there are these medical physics conferences um, where they have a look around and have no interest in approaches. Um, the problem is before technology gets used with in our system, it needs to be valued. So normally it's a smaller company, a startup, who makes that ripening process. Um, I, as a, you know, Is uh, a problem of
questions either here 